I love the chase and the hunt and I set the pace when I'm running. I always take what I want and I always give it 100. Don't need a bank, no, I'm funded. Play the game like it's nothing. I'm always thankful for something. Don't take for granted, stay humble. Now waiting, better believe in your mind, cause it's everything. You can mold, shape, find almost anything. Hey everybody, this is Praxis. As we move deeper into difficult times, the people who are in control of our society are going to have an increasingly difficult time trying to control us, the masses. They have a number of levers of control that they can pull out to try to uh, you know, manipulate the situation, and you know, I'm sure that they you know, have been and will continue to try to do that. That's just human nature. If you are in control of a situation, you don't want to lose control of that situation. The reason that they are going to have a greater chance of losing control of the situation is that as people's uh, lives get a little bit less comfortable, uh, you know, people tend to try to look for someone to blame, and the last thing that the people in power want is for you know, the masses to start pointing fingers at them. It might be justified, it might not be justified, but whether it's uh, merited or not, they're not going to want to catch any of that blame. So there are levers of control that they are going to be using to try to make it so that the last person we tend to blame are them. And one of those levers of control I'm seeing used increasingly on you know, media outlets that I'm seeing, and that is to try to get us fighting with each other instead of fighting with those people who are in control that probably have a lot more to do with the situation than all of our peers have to do with it. And one of the ways that they get us fighting with each other is by kind of putting us into different bubbles and giving those bubbles different groups of facts. It was brought to my attention recently that there was some uh, episode of the show The View. I don't watch The View. All I know about it is that there's a number of women. I think it's all women. Maybe guys are on it occasionally. But it's essentially a group of women and they just kind of chit-chat about things. And it's a way of kind of, you know, bubbling away your excess time if you've got you know, more time than you know what to do with. Uh, and uh, something that was mentioned by one of these hosts on The View was that uh, they, they, they tend to be kind of uh, you know, anti-firearms in general on, on that show, as, as is my understanding. Again, I don't watch this stuff, but whenever I see a clip of it, it tends to be you know, this kind of thing. Uh, they were talking about how uh, AR-15 ammunition, the caliber 5.56 or 2.23, uh, it can't be used legitimately for hunting because if you use it for hunting, it just destroys the animal. The animal essentially just it, you know, blows up or something like that, and you can't eat it because it's just, it's just too powerful. Which uh, is set forward as a fact on that show, uh, and it's not really questioned because the audience of that program, they just don't have any uh, world experience to really draw from to realize that that's just completely absurd. Uh, I mean, the reality with 5.56 five, or 223 as a hunting caliber ammunition for something like a deer is the problem with it is that it's probably on the, on the small side and you would risk wounding the animal and, and not actually taking the animal down, which is problematic for a number of reasons, but it certainly isn't going to you know blow an animal to, to smith the reason. I, I guess maybe if you shot a sparrow or something like that, certainly that could happen. But uh, this was put forward as a fact and you know an unquestioned fact and because people just don't have any experience with that type of thing, uh, you know, that are watching that type of show, uh, you know, it, it just gets accepted. And people just have this incorrect idea, it's a lie, as, as a fact that they, they live with. In fact, I was talking to someone just the other day that was under the impression that uh, the rounds that are fired out of an AR-15 uh, are, are essentially like little bombs, that they have like, you know, some kind of explosive charge in them. Uh, you know, after they're fired, the bullet itself has like an explosive charge and it hits something and then it explodes. And, you know, they, they picked up this completely fabricated idea from, you know, some kind of an outlet like, uh, the, like the view. So, you don't want to be learning about firearms from The View because they are mixing a bunch of lies with, you know, maybe there's some truth in there. Um, yeah, I, I guess the, the idea that an AR-15 rifle does exist, that's a fact. So I guess there are some facts mixed in with, with the lies on there. But you don't want to be learning about firearms from a, a media outlet uh, like The View. In the same way that you don't want to be learning about uh, something like uh, anthropogenic climate change. Uh, from a number of conservative media outlets. One thing that I see over and over and over again, which is stated as a fact on conservative media outlets, is that scientists make, keep uh, scientists keep making predictions about what anthropogenic climate change is going to look like, and that those con those predictions are just so uh, wildly out there that you know th they predicted 20 years ago that you know the world was going to be a cinder. Um, that is untrue. That's just an untrue statement. Uh, you know, I'm sure that there are some wacko scientists that might have said things like that in the past, but I've been following anthropogenic climate change for the past uh, several decades. I've been looking at different forecasts, different models. It's a good idea to, if you want to be a prepper, 
to have some sense of where the future is going uh, and kind of get ready think for things ahead of time. So the idea of uh, listening to the idea that anthropogenic climate change could be a thing, looking at some of the forecasts and trying to position yourself, you know, at least geographically, you know, if uh, floods are going to be more of an issue in an area, and that's kind of a prediction, you don't want to like buy uh, real estate right down near a river, that's just stupid. So, uh, you know, it makes sense to listen to some of these forecasts. I have been. And in terms of the forecasts that I've been listening to, which are kind of the mainstream forecasts, they've been pretty much spot on. And if anything, they've been a little bit on the conservative side where, you know, they were thinking things weren't going to move quite as fast. And yet, on a lot of con uh, conservative media outlets, it's just like this fact that's thrown out there in the same way that it's like a fact that, you know, you, you can't uh, go hunting with an AR-15 rifle because it's going to blow a deer apart. It's a fact that, you know, scientists are always making predictions about what climate change is going to look like and they're just, they're always way off because they, they always overblow it and everything. And that's just a fabricated lie, I think lie, <laughs> lie might be the word to use for that. Uh, and we're getting these from different media outlets. Uh, one group being fed this set of lies, one group being fed this set of lies. And people, because they just don't have any um, uh, expertise in a lot of these things, you know, they, they don't have any way of, you know, judging the veracity of a lot of these sources because, you know, if you're watching The View and someone says that if you fire this bullet at this animal, the animal is going to explode, that sounds kind of like a fact. It, it, it sounds pretty black and white. Uh, it seems like, you know, well, it can't be that far off, and yet it's just completely far off. In the same way that, you know, like those conservative media outlets, you know, if they're citing all of these scientific papers and all these scientific papers had made these predictions that are much worse than what we're actually seeing, that's probably kind of true, right? No, it's not. There are messages that are being sent out that are just making these different groups of people have different set of facts. And when you have two different sets of people, and they, are, they live in completely different facts, they live in completely different realities, uh, it's, it's really difficult for those groups of people to kind of communicate with each other, to befriend each other, to, uh, to talk with each other even. And that's a really great situation if you're an elite, if you're in the ruling class. The last thing you want is all your workers kind of chit-chatting with each other. Uh, you know, in fact, a lot of times when you know, uh, a company is hiring people, they, they, uh, they have, I forget what it's called, because I've never really worked for a large corporation, but I, or any corporation, really. I, I've always just been kind of a freelance gig kind of guy. Um, but I, I know that this is something that a lot of people that I know have uh, had to sign on to when they have worked for large companies, uh, some kind of like a non-disclosure kind of thing, where you're not allowed to, you're not allowed to talk with your coworkers about what you make. You know, why is that? Is that is that for the workers' benefit? Like they, they don't want people being pressured to talk about what they make? No, it's because they don't want people finding out that this person's got a better deal. Because if you know that this person's got a better deal than you did, and this person's got a better deal than you did, what do you think you're gonna do? What, what do you think you're gonna do? You're gonna go to management. and You're like, you know, I realize that you guys are actually willing to pay a lot more than you know what you've been paying me for this job. I would like to renegotiate with you. I mean, I've got a skill set. I've been here for a while. I'm an asset to you. I know you're paying like 10% more to all these other people. I want to get a piece of that action. The last thing that people in management want is for the people that they are managing to be really communicating with each other, especially when you have a situation where things are going to start getting dicey for everybody. Imagine that you and imagine that I are, are these elite people. Uh, and, and it, you know, I know when we talk about elites, it, it gets into the kind of conspiracy theory realm. And I think that a lot of people have the, uh, the feeling that they almost want to believe that, you know, that there are people up in the upper echelons and they're kind of pulling all the strings and they're in control of everything. And I don't really believe that. I think that the world is made up of the billions of decisions of all of uh, the individual people. And while there are people who are in power, whose decisions have a little bit more influence than other people's decisions, it's not like they're completely controlling the thing. They're the people that are in the wagon and then there are the horses. And, you know, at the moment, us, you know, the, ma the masses are kind of those horses and we're getting a little bit unruly and it's starting to get difficult for the, you know, the coach person, like, you know, the person that's supposed to control the horses to control us. You know, they're, they're trying the best that they can, but we're getting spooked and, you know, that's going to be a real problem for them. So imagine that you and I are one of those kind of coach master people where we are, you know, trying to manipulate the situation to the, you know, our best uh, benefit. And maybe, you know, we feel like, you know, we're also going to help everyone else along the way, you know, if you want to be, um, you know, uh, positive about it. But uh, the idea is 
The last thing we want to do is lose control of the situation. And you got this group of people that you're managing. You know, you and I are managing these people and we're starting to hear them whisper. And some of them are kind of, they're, they're looking our way. And they're kind of, they aren't, the, uh, the expression on their face is not something that, you, that we want to be seeing. You know, one way that we can try to make it so that those eyeballs aren't coming at us and they're starting to look at each other is to get some division going in uh, into those ranks. Try to get it so people aren't talking to each other. People aren't sharing their salaries. You give them different facts so they can't really communicate with each other. They start seeing each other as the problem. They start seeing each other as the enemy. You know, we might, yeah, this could be helpful. We could kind of whisper, it's like, hey, hey, liberals, uh, you know, you heard about those conservatives. All they want to do is just, you know, arm every crazy person and they want as many school shootings as possible. You know, you hear that, you hear that rumor about them? Yeah, you know, and the same thing with, you know, the conservatives. We start spreading some rumors with them. Hey, conservatives, you know, you hear all those liberals that, that they want like every child to be forced to have a sex change operation. You know, you start kind of swirling these rumors around. And I'm sure, I'm sure there are some people in the conservative group that like seeing school shootings. You know, there are crazy people in every group. I'm sure there are some people in that liberal group that, you know, are, are nuts and they think that every child should like have a sex change operation. Everyone that's born a boy should be turned into a girl and vice versa. And I'm sure you'll find people like that. And, you know, we're going to, you know, send some of our uh, little minions out there. They're going to get some video with these like really fringe crazy people. And then they're going to bring it back to us. And then we're going to reflect that back of the group. And we're going to be saying, hey, uh, conservatives, look at, look at what this liberal said. This is very representative of the, the large majority of liberals we're gonna be saying uh, the same thing to the liberals hey look at this look at this crazy thing this conservative said that that's representative of, of you know most if not all of those conservatives they're not your friends that is a great way of staying in control if you can get people fighting amongst themselves they're not going to be you know turning their eyes up at you as though you're the problem because the problem's their neighbor, the problem's the person down the street, the problem's the person at the school, the problem's their, you know, their, you know, their local, uh, you know, whatever. We're gonna be seeing an awful lot more of that as things get more and more dicey in our society. People in control know this. It's, I mean, for hundreds and hundreds of years, if not thousands of years, uh, you know, uh, Machiavelli you know, wrote specifically about these things. And unless you think that, you know, you're, you know, the people who are, you're running a lot of these political organizations, unless you think they're completely naive and they've never taken a statecraft course and they've never taken even like, you know, high school level history courses. If you think that they're, uh, you know, unaware of all of these, you know, you know, open secrets about how to control people. If you think, if you literally think that they're so stupid that they don't know all of these secrets, um, well, you know, maybe you shouldn't be watching this video, but anybody with a brain should be able to know that people who are in control, they know these levers of manipulation. And honestly, they'd be crazy not to use them uh, because that's, that's what they do. That's their job is to try to keep control of the situation. Uh, but for you and for I, we have to ask at what cost? Is it worth it for us to hate our neighbors uh, in order for the elites to kind of keep us under some kind of a control? But what can you and I do about that? That's the big question. Well, there are there are a lot of things that we can do about that. You know, one thing that we can do is try to vote in. <laughs> okay, yeah, I, I, I'm gonna talk about some real ideas that we can do. Uh, what you can do is work on, you know, your local individual level. We're, we all, all the time, see people engaging, especially here online, in that kind of negative divisiveness where, you know, they're pitting up against each other and, uh, you know, they don't have dialogues in a constructive way that, you know, creates anything other than maybe a serotonin boost in their own head. Whenever you see that happening, you have an opportunity to try to interject there and be a bit of a, uh, a peacekeeper, find the common ground, because there's usually common ground. You take something like, uh, you know, mentioned like school shootings. There is an awful lot of common ground between conservatives and liberals when it comes to school shootings. 100%, I'm gonna say 100%. I mean, I'm sure it's 99.999 because it's like, you know, it's crazy people in every group. Uh, but essentially 100% of everyone from both of those groups does not like the idea that kids get killed in schools. There's 100% agreement there. There's some disagreement about how to change that situation, but there's 100% agreement on the goal. In fact, whenever conservatives tend to hear stories about how dangerous the world can be, the last thing they want to be hearing, you know, is the follow-up story to that is, oh, and by the way, the government wants to come in and reduce your ability to protect your individual family from this dangerous world. I mean, like, what kind of a sales pitch is that? It's like, you, you come on the news and you tell people, the world is very dangerous, there's people getting killed, and by the way, we want to make sure that you can't do anything about it if someone comes to your house and tries to kill you and your kids. 
there was a recent uh, shooting that happened in Maine, here in New England, and uh, there was a sign on the bowling alley where, where the shooting happened, and it, and it talked about the idea of, uh, let's keep this like a family-friendly environment uh, and, and not bring firearms in. Apparently, uh, and uh, I've only heard this from one source, so I don't know if this is 100% true, but it sounds like there was a weapons malfunction with that uh, person that went in there to shoot everyone. They, they popped off one shot, and then they kind of jammed up, and if even one person had had a pistol in there, they probably could have saved, you know, the majority, if not all of the all, all of the lives that were lost in that situation. Uh, and you know, for conservative people who like the idea of keeping their ability to protect themselves, the last thing they want to be told when they're told that we live in a very dangerous world is that they they want their their right to protect their family to be stripped from them. You know, talking about that sign on the front of the bowling alley there, uh, you know, it says, let's keep a family-friendly environment. Well, to a lot of conservative people, one of the basic things that uh, is fundamental to having a family-friendly environment is safety, the safety of you and your children. And for a conservative to be told, you live in a very dangerous world, but we don't want you to be able to protect your children you know, if, if a threat arises in, in front of you. That's, you know, that's kind of a no-starter with a lot of people because they agree with the liberals that there are a lot of dangerous people out there. They agree with the liberals that they want to prevent those deaths from happening. The disagreement is in how to get there, but the, the core ideas that killing a bunch of kids is terrible, total agreement on that. The idea that you want to protect your family, total agreement on that. Again, the disagreement is just on how best to get there. And one thing that makes it really difficult is when people in these different bubbles have these crazy ideas. And it all comes back to our inability to speak with each other and our inability to problem solve with each other because people in power are poisoning the well and trying to convince us that in, in, as opposed to us all being partners in this together, that we're enemies and we should be fighting with each other. So as we go forward, keep that in your mind. Whenever you're seeing divisiveness here online or in any situation, Try to be that voice to de-escalate things. Try to be that voice to try to build bridges between people because that is the only way that we can really solve any of these problems. The elite don't want us doing that. The elite want us squabbling amongst ourselves so we're not gonna turn our attention to you know a lot of the failed policies that they've put in. But it's the only way to actually solve all these problems is for the people to start talking with each other trusting each other a little bit, having some faith in each other a little bit, and coming to a consensus because on the vast majority of these things, 99% of us agree on 99% of the questions 99% of the time. It's those fringe things that the politicians and the elite dangle in front of us to keep us fighting with each other. But that's not who we are, or at least that's not who we have to be. I hope you found this helpful and thanks for watching. Hey YouTube preppers, here's another video that you might enjoy. But before you click on it, I wanted to take a moment to thank all the people you see listed on the screen. They help to support the work that I do here over at Patreon.com. If you'd like to join them and have your name added to that list, the link's below.